Okay. Uh, as part of the last board meeting, when we passed the mask rule about after school activities, some of us have chosen to wear a mask as some of us have it, so we get that cleared up from the start. We do have uh, five speakers that would like to address the board tonight, so for all presentations, I'm going to take them in the order as they signed up. Let me uh, remind uh, the speakers tonight of some of our participation rules. Thanks for coming tonight to share your opinion. A few rules of order regarding the public comment portion of the meeting. According to board policy, each speaker has up to three minutes to speak. The speaker also may provide a written statement to the board to supplement his or her comments if desired. We'll have our board secretary, Donna Webb, keeping the time tonight. It also, I believe, will be on the screen above your head. She will hold up time cards to show you the time you have remaining. The board may not ask or answer questions or make any comment regarding public comments not, not associated with posted agenda items. The board may respond with specific factual information or existing policy may be furnished in response to inquiries on a posted agenda item. Please note that to comply with FERPA laws on student privacy, you may not mention a student by name. Additionally, according to board policy, you may not make derogatory comments about any individual staff member, either by name or title. Should you need to file a complaint, you may do this through our formal grievance process outlined in board policy. So welcome to our speakers and our first speaker is Keith Cole. Yes, please. Come on up, Keith. Welcome. General uh, concern. I was my first time, so I wasn't sure how the process worked, but sure. I know I'm late to the party on this issue, so it wasn't on the agenda, and I know you can give a response, but with regards to the mask mandates, my concern is um, if you're going to make a, a medical or advice or a mandate a medical decision for my son, as a parent, I would I would think I'd need to give consent. Um, I wasn't going to get up here and rattle off a bunch of stats, but I'm sure you guys know with the Ever since the governor lifted the, lifted the mask mandate and Tarrant County lifted it, I believe on March 10th, if I'm not mistaken, the percentages of death have gone down by 64%. The infection rate has gone by, down by 38%. Um, I have numerous studies here. I don't know if I can submit any papers, but uh, from the NIH and CDC about the efficacy of masks. And um, if you don't mind, I can read uh, just a small portion of their conclusion. Um, the, the studies by a doctor out of Stanford, and like I said, it's on the NIH website. Basically, the, the, it's a long conclusion, but just to sum it up, the, it says the existing scientific scientific evidences challenge the safety and efficacy of wearing face masks as a preventative intervention for COVID-19. The data suggests that both medical and non-medical face masks are ineffective to block human-to-human -human transmission of viral and infectious diseases such as SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Or start, yeah, supporting against the usage of face masks. Wearing face masks has been demonstrated to have substantial adverse physiological and psychological effects. These include hypoxia, shortness of breath, increased acidity, toxicity, ac activation of fear and stress response, rise in stress hormones, immunosuppression. I'm going to go, the list goes on and on. And, on. Um, and then it states at the end in conclusion governments and pol governments, policymakers, and health organizations should utilize proper and scientific evidence-based approach with respect to wearing face masks when the latter is considered as preventative intervention for public health. Um, I don't have it with me. There's another CDC uh, report that, that went from uh, year to year, I believe from March to March. Basically, theirs was neutral. Uh, they, didn't, they couldn't prove if masks help or didn't help. So my, my overall point is, I mean, as we're here today, I have a choice to wear one in here. You allow that some people are wearing them, some aren't. I'm just wondering why our children are forced to wear them when it affects them less. It's a, I believe it's a 99.98% .98 recovery rate for children, and it's even less for adults, but yet we're forcing them to wear it and we have a choice. So that's basically all the time I have. So. <laughs> and you're welcome to leave that if you'd like, okay. and, and we'll make copies and distribute it. You can give it to um, Megan on your way out or Becky. Becky, yeah. take it. She's sitting right to your right. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Next uh, speaker is, uh, I'm sorry, I'll let him finish. All right, thanks. Is Jennifer Jordan. Welcome, Jennifer. Good 
So usually I'm up here to complain and I'm not up here to complain tonight. I just want to, it's the end of the school year. Gosh, this podium does something to me. I always <laughs> cry when I'm up here. Um, the end of the school year, I just want to thank everyone for everything you have done for our kids this year. Um, we did remote learning up until the last nine weeks and the last six weeks. And I know you've got a lot of complaints about remote learning, but my family blew it out of the water. And that is thanks to Wayside Middle School and Elkins Elementary. Both my kids have IEPs and it was the most beautiful year. Um, I did write an article for someone else that kind of goes through the blessings of remote learning. And I know I'm very fortunate and very privileged to have the opportunities to stay at home with my kids. But what, the, what I've learned about how they learn, how they function in the classroom that I can share with the IEP team in the future. So now we have even more of a collaborative process because I see what they're going through and what I thought would really work in the classroom. I'm like, holy crap, this does not work at all. And so um, I'm very, very, very glad I had the opportunity. I also want to thank you, Dr. Chadwell, for making it so easy for the teachers to be able to be vaccinated. That was the number one reason I allowed both my kids to come back to school. They're both in transition years, one going to middle school, one going to high school, and I really wanted them to be able to close out that part of their education. And it's because of so many of their teachers did get vaccinated. My husband and I are both vaccinated. Um, one of my sons is very medically compromised. Um, and so that's why we've done remote learning. And so I know he, the former gentleman doesn't like the masks, but those masks are important to my kid. My kid could end up in the hospital if he gets the virus. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think y'all have done a beautiful job. I mean, the transmission rates, I know people don't like to be sent home for quarantine. And I'll tell you what, after going all year with my kids not in school, if they get quarantined, I'm going to be really mad. <laughs> but, I finally have my freedom. but I appreciate the steps that you have taken to keep everybody safe, the staff safe, the children safe, the parents safe. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm very impressed. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Misty, Misty Kishney. Good evening. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I only decided to speak about an hour ago. I planned to speak at the end of the year, but I felt like it, today was an important day to catch this month's meeting. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of being Miss K to a lot of our littles as a volunteer, as a mama, and as a voter. And I'm probably going to cry because I decided not to speak too much from paper, but to speak from my heart. Beginning of this year, none of us knew if masks were going to help or not. But we didn't know they weren't going to help. And my daughter gets strep and flu every year. She hasn't gotten it this year. So it's helped with something. I would love for the kids to have their masks off. Elkins, and I want to thank our, our teachers for sure. Um, we got pre-K this year, and <laughs> I think I told y'all in August, I just submitted that and like mask, you know, slingshots. I went, I, I got the opportunity to go into the classroom as Eli, our elf, so I was all masked up and everything, and watch the kinders and the pre-K sit with their masks on. I thought it was going to be a disaster. Every one of them had those masks on and not one kid touched their mask. That's why we don't want to remove masks too early because if we ever have to put them back on, it's gonna be a lot harder. Um, the trust I gave you in August was really big for me because I am out in the community and I deal with a lot of our kiddos and some of the kiddos have special needs. Some of the kiddos need to get back in the classroom as soon as possible. You guys have supported us feeding and passing out books and engaging with them and I know that I've made a difference this year. I haven't worried so much about masks, whether they work or don't, because a lot of my kiddos don't wear masks. Um, but I made a mask 
and they knew when they went back to school they had one and they could feel special and they could feel safe. Um, what I planned to say last year was that what our teachers, custodians, staff, crisis counselors, admin, and our school board have done this year is there's not enough money in the world to pay for what you've given our kids. You've made them feel safe and you've kept them safe. And I'm really, really impressed with that. Our custodians have just done phenomenal. Um, I want to thank the Ed Foundation because they have really supported us getting out into the community and engaging with the kiddos. Um, and I want to thank our Elkins family, especially like I said, they've just. Josie went back in January and she's been safe and protected ever since. We've not gone on quarantine one time. Um, and she's getting the education and the social she needs before she starts middle school. It's a personal choice. I don't judge anyone else for their choice either. You either wear a mask or you don't. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for keeping this district safe. Thank you, Ms. All right, our next speaker is Shannon Baird, and I believe Maddox is going to come up with her. And another you can you can share with who you oh is Maddox with you. OK, sure. Sure. Welcome. We have been my husband. Just a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. So uh, Dr. Ch uh, Chadwell, members of the board, I know that um, you'll probably know me by now. My name is Shannon Baird. I've sent many emails. Uh, with information regarding masks and you know what they're uh, doing to our children and more than anything um, just the fact that our constitutional rights uh, do they supersede any guidelines any guidelines and I'm here speaking on behalf of the children as well as teachers who are ready to get back to some normalcy being able to teach being able to see their children, their children's faces. I know the person before me, she was talking about kinders. It is very sad <laughs> that kindergartners are wearing masks. What are we teaching them? How are we teaching them? A student who has an IEP, my daughter has an IEP. She hasn't worn a mask this entire time. She's considered high risk and she has not gotten um, COVID and she's not transmitted COVID because she doesn't have it. But, you know, I um, just want to remind y'all that uh, of your oath that you swore um, to the supreme law of the land, which is the Constitution. You know, I had asked to see some documentation and research about studies that from a licensed medical professional who will tell us what is what is happening with this mask. What are the effects of these masks? And um, so far, I haven't received anything. The only thing I have seen is that in the Texas Code. Uh, 37.0023 section 4 and 7 it says that it is a form of child abuse making a child wear a mask you know we have um, inherent rights that are unlimited inalienable and unalienable all rights include our right to breathe our right to assemble to practice religious freedom to speak freely and to choose what we put on or in our bodies you mandating that we put something on our bodies is unconstitutional you know, and it makes me so sad because there are people right now who are running for a seat under the agenda that, oh, we're going to release masks. We have wonderful people here that advocate for our children, and I don't want to see them go. I want them to be here advocating for our children. So I need y'all to please advocate for our children. Please vote tonight to renew these mask mandates. Let people have a choice. Let parents parent. Let the children breathe. Maddox, what would you like to say? Um, Abbott has already lifted the mask and you can't mandate anything, and yet you do, and that is not okay. Nobody can do that except Abbott, and he shouldn't even have done it when, and the, ma the mask doesn't help. Proof, my proof is my a friend of mine wore it all the time in school, and he, he was the only person that actually got the coronavirus in my classroom, so it obviously does not work. And I don't wear a mask. I wear a face shield, but the majority wear masks, and I support them because they don't uh, research, and I feel sad that they don't. But back to the masks, the mask 
nobody likes it, but but they still make you do it. And the Constitution says that all mankind should not be at war, and that it's not really smart to wear something that the Constitution goes against. Thank you, Maddox. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baird. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Hello. I got me pointing to ask my mom is a new aide for her school. Thank you. All right, the next uh, report we have, thank you to everybody that came to speak tonight, is uh, a board member continuation continuation report. It's on page seven. And I'm proud to announce that the status of each board member's continuing education credit is that you've all uh, met the requirements of the, or exceeded the hours. And those are listed um, here in your board record book. So every board member has met each of the different uh, areas of continuing education and has exceeded their training hours. So uh, thank you for our star, Marilyn Tolbert, who had 53 hours. Marilyn, you led the way this year. Congratulations. And some of us got the minimum hours in, but everybody exceeded the minimum hours. So we, uh, we take to heart trying to keep up with the changing rules uh, in education and this continuing education sure assists us with that as well as team building. So congratulations to everybody for meeting the um, required education. Next on the agenda is the finance report, Mr. Rob Welch. So we didn't get this report, right? You're going to cover it. Uh, it's been, it's, I guess it's right up to the last minute up to date here. Absolutely. All sir. right. Yes, sir. Um, with uh, where we're at right now in the legislative session and, and working through budget and uh, there's a lot of things that are just continue to happen very, very uh, quickly and, uh, and trying to stay at top of, of those items. I want to bring you the, the latest information that we can. Uh, and so uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, touch on a couple items tonight. Uh, and that's uh, of, uh, of interest are, are some legislative items. So first item tonight is that uh, last uh, week we had House Bill uh, 1525. Uh, it went to the House floor, uh, had a number of amendments on the floor before uh, the House passed that. Uh, bill and it's a cleanup bill for House Bill 3. A lot of things that uh, uh, were uh, need to be addressed since House Bill 3 went to effect and uh, and so there's a lot of items within House Bill 1525 uh, but uh, the most material item for Eagle Mountain Saginaw ISD is the fast growth allotment. The original bill as it was filed uh, was very favorable for the district as we were looking forward um, and here I've provided a uh, a little uh, uh, projection of where the bill stands right now. Uh, but as the uh, amendments took place on the floor, uh, we ended up with a, uh, a substitute for that language that uh, provides us right now, as we look at uh, the 21-22 school year, uh, we're looking at potential loss of 1.8 million uh, compared to where we were with, with current law. Uh, now, over time, that, that uh, it will eventually provide us some some uh, gains versus what current law has, uh, but uh, uh, the original 
bill as it was filed uh, provides a, in more additional gains and, and, and really tied to the amount of growth that we uh, that we were seeing in the future uh, and would be advantageous in dealing with the, the growth that we're anticipating in the future. So uh, this is just one area that we're, you know, that we're monitoring. At this point, the bill will then move to uh, the Senate uh, for a conference committee at some point. Uh, so Senate still hasn't brought their bill to, uh, to the floor yet. Uh, right now, the Senate version of uh, the House Bill 3 cleanup is uh, it still resembles very close to current law and works very similar to current law. So we'll see what happens, but uh, we're going to continue to monitor uh, monitor that. But that definitely, uh, we're starting to see some swings in, in some of the numbers, and, and that just adds to the uncertainty of what we're dealing with right now in, in budget. Um, but uh, we'll continue to work through that, uh, monitor it, and then uh, we'll be uh, at a point where we will start bringing back some um, some decisions and looking at some uh, where we go, need to go strategically with the budget as we uh, move uh, towards the end of May as a, as a session wraps. Uh, or comment on this. As you yes. all know, we have um, worked through the Fast Growth Schools Coalition to request um, modifications to current law. Uh, I, I will say that this does not resemble what our recommendations were. We were working pretty closely with the Equity Center and Fast Growth Schools to address this statewide to basically have a per capita growth. So if you had one student or a thousand students, that there would be a per student growth number. Um, they felt that many felt that that was too expensive. Um, I felt like it was more equitable and fair, um, and it really addressed a lot of West Texas districts, but it also affected us in a positive way. This is a little different, and I was really surprised that it got through the full house because I thought that that would be knocked down um, particularly the small West Texas school districts, but it was not. And so uh, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen there, but this represents an example of the kind of swing in funding that we're dealing with right now. Yes, ha House Bill 3 is going to be voted through, and that's wonderful. But remember, there was a change in values of having the current year values, and that has had an effect of about $9 million um, on our budget. Um, and of course, that's been in effect now for a couple of years, and this is a factor and some other things I'll finish up the, his report with, but I just wanted to make a comment there that we have been recommending that they really go with a different type of uh, answer to this issue. So, Moving forward with other items that might be uh, significant to uh, the school district is ESSER funding, and we've all continued to, to hear uh, Oops. Uh, the uh, a lot of chatter about ESSER funding and where the state stands with uh, pulling those funds down from the from the um, from the federal government. Uh, just a reminder, ESSER one is uh, uh, we received about 1.4 million in state funding back in 2019-20, but that was supplanting our state. Uh, it, it was a supplant of our state funding, uh, and so those federal dollars got utilized to. To, to make this whole in, in 2019-20. Uh, what we're anticipating uh, with ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, significantly um, uh, larger amounts of dollars that are uh, earmarked or to be distributed to the, to the district. If it plays out like uh, they have um, estimated or, or anticipated, uh, the district should receive or would receive um, uh, 6.2 million under ESSER 2 and about 14 million under ESSER 3. As we understand it right now, though, as they're anticipating that the state will probably utilize ESSER 2 to make, um, uh, to take care of things at the state level. So those probably won't be seen as additional funds to the district per se, but ESSER 3 may, uh, may be distributed in, uh, to districts. And uh, so we, we may see the, uh, the benefit of that. Again, there's a lot of uh, speculation right now as far as what that will finally look like and uh, what we're going to get with it. Uh, the Our understanding what or another uh, uh, aspect of it is that I think the state may have a general idea, the legislature may have a general idea of ESSER 3 may need to get distributed to, to districts, but they can figure out what to do with ESSER 2 and they want to deal with ESSER 2 before they deal with ESSER 3. So. Whether or not we'll see any funding in the current school year, I don't know for certain. But uh, uh, as we look to next year and the following year, those those years will uh, we would be allowed to utilize those ESSER funds 
and if it's 14 million we'd be able to utilize those over again over the next two years potentially three uh, depending on if we get clearance and, and how it um, how the uh, how they will allow it to be allocated uh, in that final year uh, so there's uh, again waiting on a lot of rules uh, even regarding even regarding ESSER funding so and the reason why there's restrictions on two and three that it has to be passed on to school districts is because Texas did not pass on the ESSER dollars ESSER one onto the local school districts and so the law is written very specifically to try to get the dollars to the local LEA and they've applied for a waiver to try to get some more uh, flexibility at the state level for these dollars and so forth that has not been approved. Uh, in a meeting that we were in last week with the Coalition of Education Funding, we heard a presentation by David Thompson from Thompson and Horton about this very issue and he um, stated that most likely there'll be a special session to address it. We're not really expecting that to be in May, so this may be a June um, special session. There may be a session just for this and redistricting, or they may do that as two different special sessions. We really don't know at this point, um, but there is a considerable amount of pressure for these dollars to flow, um, and that's happening from the business community and so forth because the target of these funds is specifically to work with kids and support kids um, that have struggled um, because of the pandemic and um, all of the different things that um, that was talked about even tonight and, and to have that flexibility locally. So this is a huge swing. You can imagine a swing of um, zero or $20.2 million. So that's a pretty significant swing and that would be over two years. So um, we don't know yet and we're certainly not building that into our budget as we plan right now. Uh, when will they know what, if they get the waiver or not? The state. There's not a deadline for the for the state to, or the the feds to respond, so we really don't know. Um, Forty. And it's my understanding 40 other states have already distributed this, this to their correct. education. The federal government's not really very happy with us right now, and this is not to do with um, this administration. This precedes this administration with the ESSER dollars. Um, this is a really a discussion about what they want. Um, what the purpose of this funding is supposed to be and what it actually materializes to be in our state. So there's a big disconnect there. And so they wrote the legislation to force Texas to put the dollars at the local district level. And the goal, like you see with ESSER 1, is to supplant. And that's that's a significant concern. So we don't have a timeline yet. Uh, right now that's uh, uh uh, that's the, those are the main items that we're wa watching in the legislature. We'll continue to see what's happening on the Senate side with with their house, uh, with their uh, finance bill for school finance, and uh, we'll, uh, like I said, we'll be bringing more information back uh, in May, no doubt. We are um, expecting that we would need a, um, a special board workshop to work with this specific. If we know enough for the May meeting, that will be great, but it's quite possible that we won't. There may be a few days before the May meeting and of course the last day of the session. And so that may be possible that we would need that at the end of May and early June. Just a few things to know outstanding variables we're looking at. Student enrollment fluctuations there. Um, we have a rebounding this year. Um, so normally we see these um, um, growth patterns and, and sometimes the demographer is a little bit more right than other years, um, but it's within a range. Now this year is different because we also have a rebounding of students that have never even entered our schools. They may have moved here as a kindergartner or grown up here at kindergarten age or other ages, and those will rebound. And then, of course, we have the, um, the presentation that's going to be coming up, the, the potential of a virtual academy. Um, the cost of that academy would be in the factor, um, would be obviously a factor. The enrollment effects in that area, any other requirements at the state level. Uh, the fast growth schools allotment that he mentioned, ESSER. Um, TAVs, although now that's really not as huge of an effect on the MNO side, there is a few hundred thousand dollars that uh, there would be an effect. And also uh, just defining uh, what our additional staffing needs are in the future. So there's a report coming to you tonight for consideration to give us that flexibility when we have enrollment that needs to activate those positions. But there's a big fluctuation there. And finally, we haven't talked about compensation plan because um, we don't have enough information. So it's, I, I, I told somebody earlier that this is one of the most difficult years in which to build a budget. Even the year we had massive cuts, that was terrible, but we at least knew what was happening and 
starting in Dece December with the Comptroller in January and February. We had a whole plan through the spring. Here, there's a big mystery um, that's that's affected by all these areas, and the ESSER dollars would help us deal with that mystery a lot better. And so we're hopeful that those dollars will come through. But again, we're building a budget very conservative um, in consideration. Also, the last thing I'll say is just a consideration this year. This is a little bit of uh, not a statement that we're going to do it, but something to think about. We may need to utilize uh, fund balance um, to some degree to balance through this next year. Um, we have talked about that and entertained that and even staying above the 90 day target that TEA looks at. So not going underneath that, nothing that dramatic, but using some of those additional days that we have um, of revenue to be able to um, make it through that, uh, make it through for this next year. How much is one day worth? One day per fund balance. Um, approximately. Never look at it that way, but we'll, we, can we can get that. We can get that. Yeah. Okay. We can get that too. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. That's not hard to figure out. We just. Yeah, I, just, I could probably figure it out myself. And <laughs> yeah. How many days you know, we have? How much a day budget is? And we just divide how much we divide fund balance by how many days we have. Day, a day is. All right. Next uh, is the English language arts update on TEKS implementation. Dr. Barnes, welcome. Thank you so much. For, and um, team. And team, exactly. Yeah. Just thank you so much for allowing us to uh, participate and present to you some wonderful information tonight. I am very honored to introduce Dr. Cheryl Hunt, our secondary um, ELAR coordinator. Uh, Ms. Angela Kennedy, our elementary ELAR coordinator, Ms. Anna Damian, and she is our elementary bilingual coordinator, and they again are going to be here to show you the great things that have been happening. Thank you. And thank you again, Board of Trustees, for supporting English language arts and reading in Eagle Mountain. So what is language arts? In a nutshell, it is a curriculum of communication. This graphic that you see represents language arts in Texas. Comprehension is the trunk of the tree because it serves as the bridge between foundational skills and the more response-oriented skills of writing, office purpose and craft, research, and multiple genres. This tree is a visual from the Texas Reading Academies and mirrors our new standards, adoption materials, and test items. So we wanted to start by discussing some state initiatives in English language arts and reading. Last school year, kindergarten through eighth grade teachers implemented new instructional materials based on the TEKS that were adopted in 2017 by the Texas State Board of Education. Since Reading Academies are a Texas initiative for all kindergarten through third grade teachers this year in EMS, our kindergarten teachers, kindergarten through third grade bilingual teachers, and campus coaches go through the academy. Also, TEA began field testing new STAR items in grades three through eight including revising and editing questions as well as the items. Finally, we implemented the high school English language arts groups and new instructional materials this school year. Next year, all first and second grade teachers, intervention specialists, and principals will go through the reading academies. Pre-K materials will be implemented next school year as well. Last, the SCAR test is changing to mirror our new English language arts and reading standards and our integrated teams. Thus, the star will encompass both reading and writing in one test. As a language arts team, we've made great progress writing collaboratively with our support staff and teachers for the past two years. Each revision to our guides provides more clarity of identified power standards, aligned assessments, and district resources to support our teacher instruction and student learning. Our district professional development model has evolved to be more ongoing and job offended with a focus on building teacher leaders and teacher capacity, teacher team capacity. This creates a structure for our teachers to learn and plan together throughout the year. Thank you board for approving the district calendar for next year. It's amazing. Even in challenging times, these pieces are having positive impacts on student achievement. When comparing interim reading results, spring 2020 to spring 2021, EMS has seen increases in fourth, eighth and 10th grade. In grades third, fifth, sixth, and ninth, we were within five percentage points. 
of last year. We were feeling really encouraged heading into this next school year. An additional celebration is that 100% of our Reading Academy participants are on track to uh, complete our year one implementation. Kudos to our teachers during a year with immense extra challenges. Looking ahead, we have very strategic actions that will occur this summer and into the next school year. We've expanded summer school intervention programs for all grade levels, kindergarten through fifth grade. Some grade levels will be in a virtual format, some will be in person. In kindergarten, first and second grade, our focus will be closing gaps in phonics, phonemic awareness, and text fluency, while also developing oral language. This summer, we'll continue the work of embedding daily explicit and systematic word study lesson supports into our instructional guides that align with both the science of reading and the Texas Reading Academy practices. Next year, we'll move away from I station to M class for our literacy screener in kindergarten and first grade. It's administered one to one and provides excellent data to monitor progress of foundational literacy skills and the impact of our instructional practices. And we'll have Amplify Reading as an additional tool provided by the state that works in conjunction with the M class screener and provides ongoing computer computer based practice of these skills. And our first and second grade teachers will be next to participate in the Texas Reading Academy. In third through fifth grade summer school, we'll work to close gaps in our reading power standards while also increasing reading engagement and reading volume. Our summer curriculum work will embed weekly ICANN statements that are focused on power standard bundles with an aligned assessment connection and lesson supports to increase the clarity for teachers and what their students need to know and be able to do, how to formatively measure if they've learned it, and include specific resources to support how to teach it. Next year, we'll support our teachers through our professional development structures as they implement this work. And we'll also add the layer of teaching and assessing constructive response items and embedded revising and editing pieces. In addition, we'll expand our weekly learning spirals of previously taught uh, genres and teaks as a quick review when moving into new genres and content. We're excited about writing pre-kindergarten Spanish language arts curriculum this summer and enhancing K-5 guides in alignment with English language arts curriculum. We will be adding lesson supports such as word study and ICANN statements as well as lesson supports to bridge language learning from Spanish to English. Our summer intervention programs will serve bilingual students in grades K, pre-K-5. We're looking forward to implementing the Spanish M class literacy screener next school year. We will be adding revising and editing in grades three to five, and we'll continue to hold Spanish and French parent academies to address language barriers and keep our parents informed about our programs and services. This summer, our secondary students who need additional assistance will work with a dedicated literacy teacher on skills related to the most frequently assessed teaks. Students will engage in small group lessons and conferences with their teacher, as well as monitor their growth through an online computer program. Additionally, dedicated curriculum writers will tighten up our assessments to hone in on our power standards. Adaptations and enhancements to our curriculum will mirror the changes to the TEKS and our new STAR. AP teachers will meet together to discuss new results, as well as to plan and set goals for next school year. In 21-22, we will introduce and practice shorter and longer constructive responses based on informational and literary tests. In English 3 and English 4, students will continue to work on college and career readiness by exploring projects and essays that engage them in thinking about their future, as well as working through test questions that can be found in the ACT, FAZ, and TSI. We refer to John Hattie's research on influences on student achievement as a guide included in our EMSISD torch. Hattie states that an effect of 0.60 or higher is likely to have a large impact on student achievement. When we're looking to accelerate achievement and close gaps, we want to look for instructional practices with large effects. This makes collective teacher efficacy stand out as an extremely impactful strategy. It is the collective belief that transforms student learning in a building and across our buildings. We feel that we have the foundational structures and resources in place to foster collective efficacy. These structures and resources take your support as a board, and for that, we really want to thank you.
Any questions? Well, I was really surprised with this research when I read it. You know, of course, it all was teacher uh, related and efficacy was the top notch. But um, so basically, just for my clarification or our clarification as a board, we're going to continue with what we have, our programs that work, and we're just going to expand with grade levels and then carry it a little deeper. Is that a, is that okay? I don't think we could have said it better ourselves. <laughs> okay, so no extra initiatives, just do what we're doing and perfect it even more and, and, and include more grade levels, okay? And then my other question is where in this, and I may have missed it, um, with what we've gone through, the assessment aspect of it. Um, I mean, is that continual all the time? Is that a continuation? I know the teachers, you know, in the classroom do it, but I, is, is that, I guess, how are we collecting that data on where we are and where the students are and, and um, in regards to what we've gone through with the both hybrid, you know, teaching? in a variety of ways. So in short increments and longer increments, screeners, we have ways to administer our screeners remotely and in person. Um, we have screeners that happen three times a year. We also have district assessments. Um, this year we've worked as a team to make sure that everything that we gave as a district assessment in grades 3, 12, yeah. were online and able to be administered um, in an online format remotely. So it's like been, con been continuing. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Barnes will, I mean, do we know where, how our students overall, or is it too premature to find out, you know, how we've done throughout this year that's been, you know? Yes, the, the data at this point is showing that uh, there is a learning loss, but not as much as we predicted. Um, and the data now nationwide is starting to come out that uh, we were predicting very strong day year to two year learning loss. Uh, we are seeing some, but again, uh, it's, it's, we believe that the way that these individuals have done an amazing job of spiraling uh, and looping throughout the curriculum, that was very much a strong focus for, for us this year, is that we are going to be able to not only catch students up that did experience learning loss, but also still be able to accelerate students that did not have that learning loss. So our focus very strongly is still on every single student and how they individually learn. And so the students that we feel are, have been critically um, affected by this, these are the ones we're inviting Yes, to the summer and yes. summer school is the month of June. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, uh, our students um, with our um, intervention and uh, small group instruction to be able to help with our uh, ELA literacy <coughs> and phonics support will be receiving special invitations for their teachers. So, will we have more than anticipated in summer yes, school? Okay. And we are very excited about that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. <coughs> and Mr. President, uh, the number that you asked for earlier, it's uh, five hundred thousand a day, is the is the amount that uh, should be that would that's in the fund balance. Correct. Okay, thank you. Go. Great. I was putting in uh, notes for the board update. I'll give you an overview of summer school as well on those. Thank you. Next is an EMS ISD Virtual Academy presentation, Dr. Parker. Thank you so much and good evening board members. I'm here to present an overview of what is happening with current Texas legislation on virtual schools and what we would plan for EMS ISD uh, for a virtual academy. Key on tonight's presentation is the note that you'll see right here on the slide pending legislation and board approval. So everything is a would and a possibility. As I move through the slides tonight, I'll start with our mission, which is at the root of all we do, and then the current legislation with a focus on three bills that we are watching and, and then move through what we are able to support for the virtual academy in EMS ISD. This is an overview of what we have created for the possible academy regarding key elements curriculum, staffing requirements, and a timeline. We, of course, must start with our mission, for it is the driving force behind 
our work <clears throat> built upon our core beliefs. The culture of, culture of excellence that instills a passion for a lifetime of continuous achievement in every student is a challenge when we work to create an EMS ISD virtual academy. Our teachers, our students, our parents, our administrators have done such an incredible job this year in working in a hybrid model, serving students, working to meet their needs in this remote environment, and both hybrid and in, in person. If a virtual academy is provided, this means the students who are, who are accepted into this academy are virtual every day, every period, not coming to campus, all except for federal or state testing requirements. So it's very different from the hybrid model that we're seeing today that we've been living in this past year in the pandemic. This is full time remote in a synchronous setting with a daily set schedule to follow for our early learners. We cannot meet the culture of excellence we find in our mission. While I will take you through what an academy would look like for the early learners as well as the secondary learners, know that with the critical literacy skills, the social skills, the characteristics of a learner that are be being developed in those early years of pre-K through fifth grade, it is just not possible to meet the mission of excellence at this age. Our students are emerging from remote and hybrid learning with gaps. We're working to improve those. You've just heard that, but they do have some gaps. We do not want to grow those gaps. We want to decrease them. I will come back to the early learner in my presentation as I go through. The second piece is the purpose. Why are we providing an EMS ISD virtual academy? The purpose of the virtual academy centers, centers around the alternative means of earning a high school diploma for the student who A, prefers a virtual setting and B, has exhibited success this year in the remote environment. I'd like to take you through three pieces of legislation that we're seeing. There are several pieces and so I picked out three key, the last one being the main one. Senate Bill 348. In this bill, it would allow student, uh, parents to observe everything in the virtual environment from the instruction to the instructional material to the teaching aids and resources, as well as the time in class. House Bill 1468 is protecting the current Texas Virtual Schools Network courses, meaning that the district would must use, if this bill passes, the district in order to have a virtual school would have to use the Texas Virtual Schools Network for all courses. The only time they would be able to create their own courses are for those that are not already part of the Virtual Schools Network. This would cost $375 per student, per course, per semester. Senate Bill 27 has the greatest components to a virtual school and the requirements that would be placed on the district. Key pieces of the legislation are listed here. First, the virtual campus, there would be one virtual campus per district with full course loads for assessed areas and grades. Here, this is where they must meet all accountability as well. It would have its own PEMS code and uh, meet all requirements of the federal and state uh, state governments. The commissioner would determine the number of students admitted to the virtual academy. There is a lottery with a wait list. The schools can be open enrollment. What this means is the school, if the district chose for this, the virtual school to be open enrollment, they would go into a catalog of open enrollment schools in the state of Texas, and then parents would choose the school that they would like to attend. Lots of school choice in this one. Key here is funding. Funding is only given on, upon completion of the courses. Thus, if you served a student for say three months, and then that student leaves, the district would get no funding. As a fast growth district with a high mobility rate, this causes some concern for us. Now, let's move into what we think a virtual academy would look like for Eagle Mountain Saginaw should we choose to go to this path with your direction and, and receive funding from the state. 
I'm going to go back just for a second. Linda. Yes, sir. Just to, I think Linda did a great job giving an overview of those, but just to reiterate, both of these have significant financial implications. So the ability to do this and make budget, and especially what you saw in the staffing numbers, when we see nearly $2 million in staffing, that has to be offset by revenue. And if there are revenue requirements of paying a fee, for example, in the House bill example, or in the Senate bill example, creating basically a competitive environment, both of those have concerns. It's possible both bills could get passed because they cover different things. There's a virtual school network now, and that virtual school network, any child in any district in the state can attend um, the school in Great McCauleyville, for example, or Hallsville ISD, or the, or the others. Yeah, the, and take one, they could be enrolled with us and take right. one course in Texas virtual schools. It's limited on the number they can take right now. I think it's two uh, per year, unless they release the, the requirement that it's two. Okay, it's still two. And previously, when it first started, the state reimbursed you for the cost. Right. So tracking these bills, these bills aren't near the finish line yet. Um, it's possible that they could fizzle out and nothing happens, both pass, or there could be a significant number of amendments before they're passed. And even if they do get passed, the governor has to sign off, sign off on it. At this point, the governor has not made any comment about what his feelings are in sustaining a remote environment into the future. That, I'm not saying it's not going to happen, just going to say it's a huge mystery right now. So districts that have come out and said we are going to do X, Y, and Z, they're not basing it on any current law or any kind of funding system. It is with the uh, presupposition that it's going to happen which I understand why, because they're trying to plan ahead. The problem is, is it's kind of a false promise, uh, potentially. You're gonna tell people, get them excited, they go that direction, then all of a sudden it doesn't happen. And so we're in kind of a holding pattern. Sounds similar to the finance report. So but we're, we have to do the preparations regardless. And so, go ahead. So let me move forward with what the possible EMSIC Virtual Academy would look like. Here would be key components for the, uh, for the success of this virtual academy. First of all, we'd have to have independent, self-motivated and self-directed students. We must acknowledge that a student in a virtual, uh, I'm sorry, I just said that, pardon me. Our staff must be professional and engaging with high expectations and standards that are found in our brick and mortar buildings. We would seek strong parental involvement as well as uh, provide all access to the technolo technological tools that would need be needed for a student to be successful. You will see similarities as we go through what we've created for the possibility of the Virtual Academy and Senate Bill 27 in some areas. In regards to this, especially in the components and some processes, the EMS ISC Virtual Academy would have a limited number of students. We would use a multi-step selection process with a, a, a randomized lottery selection for the selection of names who have uh, students who have submitted interest to join the academy. The selection process after the lottery would include a follow up application as well as an in person conference. Curriculum is key here. The pre K through five, fifth grade learners would follow the district curriculum for our kindergarten through fifth grade. This would include the workshop model that uh, in reading and math. 6th through 12th grades would look different as we would utilize the online program of Edgenuity to deliver the curriculum with teacher support and guidance. All levels would continue to use Teams as the meeting platform for lessons. And note here, all courses are taken virtually and there would be a need for an at-home facilitator uh, to ensure success. I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to that in just a moment. Enrollment is listed here for pre-K through five, as well as six through 12. Enrollment in the academy would be limited. 50 per grade level if offered at pre-K through fifth grade and 100 per grade level for six through 12. This is what we believe we would be able to support with the budget that we have created. This slide shows a more detailed explanation of the process for application and selection of the students. It begins with the submission of interest with the name, grade, and address of the student. And then it goes through the multi-process 
uh, before final admission is granted. This ensures that we have not uh, that we have not only completed the random selection through the lottery portion, but we have also reviewed the data of the student, verified home support for learning, and held a conference to address expectations before final approval is given. Students not selected to the academy would go on a wait list. The opportunity to join the academy for these students would be given at the end of grading periods at set times when openings occur. At the Virtual Academy, a standard unweighted curriculum with limited electives and endorsements would be offered. District approved dual credit through TCC would receive a weighted average for the virtual learner. Because a non-negotiable with this plan is the teacher teaching only in one method, there will be no hybrid teaching assignments. So as a teacher, I'm not going to teach in person and online. This non-negotiable thus creates a limited schedule in course selection. Students attending the academy would still, however, be able to graduate on the foundation plan with endorsements, just like our in-person learners. They just would be limited on what those endorsements would be and what their electives would be. Dr. Parker, just to elaborate on one thing, if we were to extend that into our more advanced curriculum and elective offerings, inevitably you'd have hybrid because you just wouldn't have enough numbers. Um, you would not have enough numbers of kids to take any of those, especially low enrollment courses that you have every year, one or two sections of AP in particular, or your, um, or your current technology courses. We know how many, how much variety we have there. And so our, our goal is if we're going to be excellent, we're going to be excellent at less things than trying to be less excellent or average at a lot of things. And offer everything. We're trying to do it in a hybrid right. fashion. Our teachers have done an incredible work and our kids have too this year, but we know that's not sustainable to ask a teacher to teach those groups concurrently. And so this model does not have concurrent teaching of, 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 of students in an in-person and, mm -hmm. and, and virtual, as she said earlier. It um, also um, supports both the in-person learner, I mean, in-person teacher and virtual teaching teacher because they would we wouldn't say, okay, you're going to teach three in person and then three classes of remote. It does not set that up for that. The next slide is about teaching and learning virtually. I've said it before, but I repeat it's synchronous learning, which means set schedule, set time, class periods going throughout the day. The parent, the at home learning facilitator, we, we believe is critical for uh, ensuring that the student's success. This is an adult who would who would ensure the day to day activities of, of school are occurring. This person ensures the student has the necessary space, tools and equipment to access school daily. The fa uh, facilitator also supports the student by making sure the student is completing assignments on time and ensuring that student is communicating effectively with teachers and attending all classes. I want to point out that the curriculum and engagement pieces that are built on the synchronous model of attendance. This means again, the student would be asked to be online at specific times during the day. This would not be like remote learning where, we, where a child has an ability to engage in the early mornings or even in the late evenings. So this is a set time. The teacher at their elementary level would be teaching the EMSISD curriculum. However, with a secondary curriculum, the TEKS would be followed through Edgenuity, an online curriculum program which with teacher support and direction. Due to the limited number of staff and the varied course offerings, just like we were discussing for a virtual school and our own commitment to not have any teacher do a hybrid course next year. That's why the limited pieces. Edgenuity is our choice also for the curriculum support because of the courses it is able to offer. I'd like to know that the teacher would still be leading some direct teach, some reteach, individual conferences, some uh, discussion groups at set times. These would be during that set schedule. And so I may be working on ingenuity. Then I could I have an issue. I can pop into teams where the teacher is, get some assistance. Teacher may be conferencing, have to take a break to do a reteach and then come back to the conference. So it would look different than it has this year. Very different. 
This slide displays the expectations we would have of a virtual learner. Key traits that, that uh, help the student be successful are listed here. Self-motivated, self-directed, indiv prefers that individualized mode of learning. They need to be excited and comfortable with technology. They should have already demonstrated academic success on their final report card or their transcript. They should be performing at grade level, be good standing in attendance, and they need to provide all of the documents required for enrollment. Dr. Chadwell alluded to staffing just a moment ago. This uh, chart here shows you both what would be take, uh, what it would take to staff a virtual academy at each level. I'd like to note that the secondary teachers, including special education, would be shared across those secondary levels. OK, so I could be teaching English four, English two, eighth grade and seventh grade English, you know, so they will be shared. <laughs> Same with our uh, special education teachers and Kate, Spanish, as well as the PE and health. The school would be served by one administrator, the principal, as well as a counselor and a designated instructional specialist. There would, would one para would be uh, both the PEMS clerk, the attendance clerk, as well as the, the school secretary. Total cost for a pre-K through 12th grade program would be $2.78 million. Total cost for a secondary virtual academy would be $2.038 million. I state in parentheses the principal that is included in these numbers, the overall cost, to give you clarity for when you see Dr. Donkin's report, we have taken the principal and made it a line item for you as a standalone for staffing. This is so that we are able to address it as a separate line item upon the direction that the board gives us tonight and as for next steps. Our recommendation is for pre-K through fifth grade, our recommendation is for in-person only. And I'll address the specifics after I say the recommendation for sixth through 12th would be a virtual academy option if the board and funding desires and the adequate funding is there. It is our recommendation that students in grades pre-K through five should be provided only in-person instruction. We talked about this a great deal and we these are the reasons we have come up with in Bolivian. First of all, curriculum is based upon the use of manipulatives with co collaborative interaction with their peers. The workshop model requires social interaction, collaboration, cooperation, and self-regulation skills all being learned at the elementary level. In the physical classroom, children at this developmental stage are growing in their ability to watch, observe, join, and participate with others. Cooperative play is at a critical development stage with our early learners, where they learn how to share, self-regulate, compromise, problem solve, and think critically. That stimulation that is found in that classroom environment engages the elementary student as they become aware of and learn social norms while not navigating variety of environments in the brick and mortar building that will carry on with them for the rest of their life. Finally, children learn citizenship and socially appropriate behavior in the developmental years that truly do guide them the rest <coughs> of their life. Our timeline or our next steps are follows. This is the April board meeting. I want to provide you with an overview and ask you to consider if you want to move forward with this, the, the posting and hiring of a virtual academy principal. In May, we would work to get that principal actually as soon as we get your direction, we would work to get that principal uh, position posted and hired and begin development of the processes that need to be in place, including the handbook and the lottery. May 31st, which is the last day of the 87th legislature, Texas legislature, we're looking for some things to come out of that either before May 31st or by May 30 or on May 31st. First, if inadequate state funding and or unacceptable requirements are put forth through the legislature, we ask that we stop plans and absorb the administrator into the campus based administration team. If it is funded adequately, virtual schools are, and with acceptable requirements, then we would immediately seek a board approval of the plan. 
This means in early June, we would bring final plan to the board for consideration. If the legislation finalizes on virtual schools before our May board meeting, we would bring it to the May board meeting for consideration. Additional steps include again, hiring the principal in May and development of handbook lottery process, all of those if board approval is given. Post positions for the faculty, the website goes live, communicate the academy to parents with timeline for application. If approved in June, we start posting interviews, hiring a faculty. June and July, we do the student application process. We do staff training in July and August. And by August 16th, we have our campus up and running in the virtual world and we start school. The application timeline is tentative based on your direction. And as you can see, it's pretty tight. And so seven step process at each step we, we review, we look at the application. We first start with the submission of the interest letter. Then we go through the lottery, randomized lottery. We have 100 kids at each grade level in six through 12 that we're looking at. Those that don't make the randomized lottery would go on a wait list. And then we start, we notify them and we start the application piece. Once the applications are received, again, we go through the process. If we don't have 100 kids, we go back to the wait list and we bring in some more and we continue that process until we've met an efficient staffing for the virtual academy uh, to meet the, the demands. July 19th through August 6th, after conferences and, and interviews are held, notification will be provided. Thank you. What questions do you have for me? I've got a question, I guess. Um, so implicit in this is that our intent would be for the rest of the campus to be is back in person learning. Yes, and back in person learning. I think we need to communicate that to our families. I don't think our families understand that on a wholesale basis. And so I know there are some wild cards out there what the legislation will do or what the governor might do, but I think we can put that in a communication okay. and, and spell that out for our parents. Because I, I, really, I mean, I think the people in this room know that and think that's a given. I don't think our community does. Good point. We will work on that. Well, and we've started to um, build a communication piece. Um, really, your input tonight is, is significant to that. And my hopes is have it out by midweek, most likely Wednesday, no later than Thursday. And so we'll have that information out pretty quick and also just talking about a little bit about next year. One thing that's challenging is that uh, even outside of this is that we contacted TEA and Holly knows because she contacted them, Holly Smith, our director of, of health, and their comment was that we wouldn't get any um, direction on our COVID mitigation strategies until midsummer. Now, we know our numbers look good. Things are getting a lot better. We know that. We feel a lot more confident in that. And we're also very hopeful and 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 feel like that that's where it's leading for this next year that we'll be able to relieve ourselves of quarantine and um, and and other types of masks and other things like that, um, social distancing, et cetera. But we are waiting for for the, that direction. We are but I think we can go ahead and communicate oh, that to absolutely. parents and, and just say, and here's the decision tree. You know, if we get this type of directive, we're yes. going to have to follow it. But That's exactly what we're right. putting together. The parents have yeah. to make decisions now about yes. Yes, exactly. Right. So, exactly. Uh, and I think it would be nice to have like a, deci you know, a decision tree, so to speak. So if this, you know, this is what we're planning. If, you know, the if the commissioner says we need to do this, then that would change this and this. I mean, I think that would be important. I really do think that we need to let families know that. I agree with you, Paige, that, that we know what's happening. Dr. Sure. Parker, my question is, were you finished by the way, Paige? Yeah. Well, I was going to call on Tim next, then we'll come back. <laughs> well, to I didn't see him. That's okay. Uh, Tim. Sorry about uh, that. So if we do the 6 through tw uh, 12, uh, if for the little over $2 million price tag, what is our break-even number uh, for the number of kids we need to be in the virtual academy to get to the $2 million figure? Let me do that real quick. We've got a limit on it. I hope it's at least that. We have a limit on the number of kids who can go in 700, which that's yeah, 700, but, I'm, but how much surely we are to break even point way before the staffing, the staffing is around 350. Um, we have 350 or more. That's staffing students, students 350. 
then that would pay for itself if we had 350 or more. Well, and then we have the edge annuity product. We have some other things, but it's just as far as staffing. I mean, I can pull that up right now. Mm -hmm. We'd need about um, 350 students to pay for the staffing. And the, the other part of that is we have to consider if this is not an option if students leave because of that. If students say you don't offer online, so I'm not going to stay here. Who knows how many that would be true? Exactly. But. Exactly. So, for example, right now we have 76% of our students, um, and this is based on a survey with parents that we just did with K-12. That 76%. When asked this question, would COVID not, when COVID-19 mitigation protocols such as social distancing, mass quarantining are no longer required, what are your plans for your child's education? 76% said traditional, 7% said remote, 1% said remote instruction outside of EMS, 2% said attend the school other than EMS, and 14% said I, they did not know. So if we just go off the remote instruction of 7%, that's a uh, um, that's when I'm talking to other districts, they're looking at about that number yeah. five to seven percent that may want to continue on remote. Yeah. How many what percent is that? Five percent of our enrollment? Ours is about the 700 would target three percent. Three percent. So we're going to have a waiting list under this right. uh, yes. received mm -hmm. scenario. But you also we have to remember I mean, we're looking we like in this. the enrollment yeah. process. There's key pieces in there. Success this year in the remote setting. If they weren't successful this year, they would need to come back into that the brick and mortar building. And one other thing we're seeing at the high school, oh, not the high school, all levels, is that parents that feel concerned about coming back, there's a metric that hits. It may be positivity rates. It may be vaccinations are available. It may be masks aren't required. It, it, it's something like that. And I, I believe that just watching this data change all the time, I think that number will actually go down. I think mm -hmm. because this is we're seeing at the elementary level. I know we're talking to Miss Dunn at the elementary level. Once people are coming back, they're they're just ready. But they were waiting for that thing, whatever that thing is, that made them feel more comfortable to have their kids back and in person. Liz, just uh, the ingenuity, 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 ingenuity. ingenuity. Um, and why and were we given like several companies to choose from? Was it state? We were. Did okay. we do our own research? Yes. 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 To okay. everything. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Several years ago, we had uh, there was ingenuity was coming. A lot of people were using in our district in the consortium we're with every other Tuesday morning. Ingenuity is used. Uh, we saw that at Keller, Northwest, Birdwell. Mm -hmm. Several have already used it. We've used Odysseyware for the past multiple yes, years. Is. However, Ingenuity bought Odysseyware, mm -hmm. and the Ingenuity piece is stronger and more robust than the Odyssey piece. So, so we're moving to it. So it's really connected mm -hmm. district wide then with our Watson Learning that you was using. Watson today? Learning is uh, on Odysseyware right now, but we'll be moving to Ingenuity. Okay. So we'll all be so we'll all be on. The Thank same. You. And the same company. And it's it and it's good. I think it will only grow to be better and stronger as we get to do our touch with curriculum. On it. It's much more robust. Yeah. Much more robust. Yeah. Is this a requirement of the state or is this totally at, our option? At Virtual this point, academy. it is totally our option. And so, we would consider this because we don't want to lose enrollment and we're so afraid we'd lose money. We've put all this time and effort into something that we've never done before because we pray somebody they're going to go somewhere else. Is well, that the basic? Well, I, we're preparing this for, for two main reasons. One is we really don't know what this state will do. Um, right now, they have not said anything about this being required, but they're they're in session and they could come in and say any district over a certain size must have, you know, and then all of a sudden we have to put I mean, we experienced a little bit right. of that last summer. Um, the other part of it is is this conversation right now. I mean, what you think and your beliefs and your 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 philosophies in this area are key. You know, I have my own um, beliefs. I, I have um, concerns over people doing um, virtual for over long periods of time. I know there's always exceptions to the rule, and I know that there are some individuals that can be successful in this environment. But doing that over long periods of time concerned me. That's one reason why we don't support a K through five model is for the developmental reasons that you talk about. And I'm 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 concerned about kids not being in a social environment for years at a time. 
Um, as far as the money, that is a reality. I mean, as far as being able to uh, lose enrollment and then have people come right back to us and that of trying to, we know that this is a, uh, a request by some uh, people that are listening to this right now are going to say, yes, this is this was good for my kid. I want to continue it. And so we are acknowledging the fact that there is a demand for it, um, but it also comes at a cost, you know, a cost of resources and essentially having two types of school at the same time. Um, and that that is a that is a challenge to do, and that's one reason why she started with the mission, and that is one reason why we curtail this down to something that we feel like we can support, and that kids will finish it and have an excellent product, albeit a slimmed down curriculum. They will have what they need at a high level with teachers that want to be there, that are successful at being there, and are certified and high performing in an, in a remote environment. Okay, I was just curious that. If it's required by the state, then obviously we need to we're doing the right thing. If it's not required by the state, then I think we seven people have to, you know, make sure that we're given direction that we think the community and that, that we want them to take, whether this is even something to spend our time on or, or not to spend our time on. Because so. this would if we chose not to do this, if it was our choice and not dictated by the state. Uh, ultimately, it would be basically the same as <clears throat> it would be a one year hit for the most part, just like it was when the charter school opened. Very similar. Yes. Yeah. Good and, and, and going back to the Senate and the House bills, there could be an ability to do it, but then there are certain financial requirements that get placed on top of it. And that's a concern because if they turn around and say you have to do X, Y, or Z and pay so much per kid, we may say, well, we want to, we may, y'all may decide, I think it's a, we, we're convinced we want to do it. Then all of a sudden the financial impact is way beyond just the staffing that we're committing to it and the resources are actually um, additional costs. That there seems to be a strong sense to protect the Texas Virtual Schools Network. And I can tell you as a former principal, the Texas Virtual Schools Network was set up where a child could get one or two credits you know, outside of their regular school day in that virtual environment to, you know, to for a need for whatever need they had. And it was very successful one or two through the course of a year, not four to five or seven in one one day each day, one semester. And, the, and as far as the age, what it could be moved up to even high schoolers and leave middle schoolers out of it. Yes. Could, we could say, OK, well, we fine, we're going to do it mm -hmm. for not. We like it for nine through 12, but not six through yes. eight. So if we did that, the cost that you would be taking away would be 719,000. So it would bring it down to about 1.2 million. Does it change the size that is, you'd offer it at the high school uh, level? That's not, it, it, I would still have to add the secretary and the instructional tech because mm -hmm. if we're going to have this and we're going to do it right, we need to have that instructional tech. Wouldn't there. that also change possibly the size that you'd offer at the high school level then too because you have more capacity because you said those teachers were going to be doing both middle school um, and high school. It, it, we could, it would be tight, but we could make it work. We could make it work. So what it means is to it, you're, if you're having 400, you're in seven, instead of serving like 150 to 175 kids in a brick and mortar building, you're going to be serving 200 online. But you also don't have other things to, that you're required to do if you're a virtual teacher. I had a question about the um, at home learning facilitator. Yes, I would think if we end up going forward with something like this, there could be some kids who might be an excellent candidate for this program, but might not have somebody at home that could do this. Now, so we remember, it doesn't process. say that they have to be at home every day. If I were do, if I were recommending elementary, I would say they have to be home beside the child. What this really looks like is we need we need somebody to be responsible. Yes, okay. but so, maybe in some cases that might be that student. I could see a, a high school student who might be able to do this themselves, and so maybe there's some, you know, right. without but the a parent I mean, some, needs to be involved in because. But all not all what our do parents I do are. That goes, that, goes, I mean, you know, so we well might then, have a kid who'd be a great candidate for this who might not be able to get that support at home. Well, that's one reason through the application process. If that was true this year. That child would have already demonstrated that this year. So there might be an exception for a child. Well, and understand the that, facilitator. Demonstrated the facilitator is a person responsible. That doesn't mean that the person is. So it at, might even be able to be a counselor or something like that that could sponsor. Well, it wouldn't the child. be one of our staff. It'd be somebody that they would choose. It could be an uncle, an aunt, a grandparent. Um, Someone anybody. in the home setting you may that have can some, ensure they have a place to work. Yeah. And they they're communicating in that they're getting their grades in. 
I mean, I've made phone calls to parents <coughs> who, whose kids are at home and said, you know, have you checked your kids' grades? No, we always just great. Well, not right now. We need someone who's doing that on a regular basis. This station. has been an issue. This has been an issue of kids that haven't logged on for two to three weeks. We can't get a hold of a parent and we finally get a hold of them. And now this child's three, four weeks behind and we need to make sure that someone understands that. And they'll say, well, my child said they were fine. So they're, they said they were fine, but they're not fine. And so we need to make sure we have a person. But again, we're going to have a proven track record from this year to be able to base it on. We're, it, that part is not really a, um, one that we're looking at somebody that's setting by their child. No. All day. Yeah. We would have needed that for elementary if we yes. mm -hmm, recommended elementary. Any other comments? Y'all have a clear direction? Well, I, I, I do because I feel like we're all still learning and I'm okay, okay with that if y'all are. And so uh, obviously you'll have an opportunity to consider uh, the principal role because we do need to have somebody that's focusing a tremendous amount of energy in the upcoming weeks. And we'll know more through May. We'll give you updates and then coming up to that May 24th meeting. Uh, this is probably going to be one of those items that you're going to we're going to find out about uh, on the news and then try to find out what just happened and then have to read the bill to find out what are the rules. One thing I didn't mention is an example is accountability uh, under one system. All the accountability. Uh, yeah, you said it, but just to stress this, that if a school, a separate school like this got a C or lower, the district cannot be an A. And so remember this year we or two years ago, we were an 88. And so it wouldn't matter if we were a 99. If you had this one school that was underneath that threshold that brings the entire accountability system down for the entire school district. And so there's a lot of things that have to do with that of how that's tracked and the control for that area. So we're there's a so, lot to learn about it. So prior to COVID, we, this system existed. You mentioned it as a high school principal. You had, you had, had students in the virtual network. For right, one or it was two not students. a virtual academy. They would take one course virtually, kind of like a, a virtual dual credit course. Did we do that here? Do we have any of that? We have. We've had a few people do that, mm -hmm. but moreover, what we have are like the um, university, I University Prep over in Great Moncolyville. You have the Hallsville Online School. We've had people do online K12.org and those kinds of things, and that's existed, and it's not something we've pursued. As I've as I've shared, I have some significant concerns that kids can achieve their goals if all they're doing is working and doing virtual. I, I don't think there's, I think it has to be complemented. Um, we know parents that do an incredible job supplementing that experience with other enrichment activities and have done an incredible job, but they're hands on with it. But having a child sit in their bedroom or at their kitchen table going through a curriculum, interacting with their teachers, but never being around other people, I have I have concerns about that. Well, I, I guess that leads me to a question too. Then, how would this work with extracurricular activities? Would they be available for not. those of their own home? So, the, this would be available to a kid who was no, no in our band or played football. No, ma'am. And our our reason for that is because that has not been successful this year. There has been examples of that where people could do that, but it's also been an incredibly onerous situation, kind of like teaching hybrid, of having people come in and out, not show for practices. And we've all kind of dealt with it because it's we call it a COVID year, but trying to sustain that into the future, we're very concerned about that. I'll, I'll finish with this on, uh, unless there's any other questions. I, I have a, a, a family member, uh, a niece that's been very successful in an online school. Um, she, they live out of our area and it's a fit for the family and I see it. But they also do exactly what I just talked about. They find other opportunities for her to be enriched in other areas. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying it's people have to be very conscientious about what they do in order to provide for their kids if they're going to choose this long term. I will say if you give us directive to move forward, you know, we are an EMS and we live that mission. It will be it will be good. It will be good for as good as we can make a virtual academy. We believe that. I believe yeah. that. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Thank you. 
It is currently 624 p.m. on April 26th, 2021. This board will now recess for dinner and then reconvene in a closed meeting pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Section 551.071, consultation with attorney, 551.072, purchase of board to purchase, exchange, or lease, or value of real property, 551.074, deliberating the appointment, employment, reassignment, and duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee. 551.075 for the purpose of deliberating regarding employment or specific, specific occasions for implementation of security personnel. Under 551.074, we're also considering contracts for district personnel tonight. Yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Added that in. 551.082, considering discipline of a public school child. And 551.021, to discuss specific personal identification information about a student. The board is reconvening the public meeting on April 26, 2021 at 7.05 p.m. and will now consider the subject set forth in the posted agenda. And a little bit of a change, uh, we're going to go back to reports. Uh, we're going to do the opening ceremony first. Yes, sir. OK, hold on, Dr. Dawkins. Okay. We'll go to the opening ceremony and it's Rubenton Point Elementary School. All right, we have students from Remington Point Elementary School that are going to con conduct the meeting today. I want to introduce those students. The first student is um, Richa Nubigacha. She's fifth grade. Um, parents are Emery Nagacha and Safak Nagipi. Uh, Mircha enjoys reading and writing. She loves to play outside and, and being silly with her friends. And she loves math and hopes to be a math teacher one day. That's awesome. That's what we want to hear. Uh, next student is from Remington Point is Damien Ortiz. Damien is in second grade. Parents are Marilee Almost and Christian Ortiz. Damien wants to play in the NFL one day and his favorite food is enchiladas. Uh, Damien is a student in our bilingual program. He loves watching Tom and Jerry and reading the Dogman book series. Uh, next student is Ryan Riddle. Ryan is in third grade. Parents are Rachel and Nicholas Riddle. Ryan is a gymnast and wants to be a second grade teacher when she grows up. Mm -hmm. And she loves Harry Potter, movies, and pizza. Who doesn't? So that is awesome. We have two teachers in the bunch. And so we will turn it over to them. I'm Shady Kerr, the principal at Remington Point Elementary. It's my pleasure to introduce you to three of Remington Point's finest. With us this evening is Ryan, Maricha, and Damien. Please rise and join us in the pledges to our American and Texas flag. Por favor, pónganse de pie y únanse a nosotros. Es nuestro juramento a la bandera de América y Texas. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the, the Texas, Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Please remain standing and join us in the moment of silence. At this time, we'd like to thank all of our board members and central office administrators for the wonderful care that you take of all of our staff and students. We appreciate your hard work and Go Panthers! Thank you, Riverton Point and Dr. Curran for the uh, opening ceremony. Do we have any communications? Tonight? No, sir, not, not, not to say. Okay. 
Sorry, I got ahead of myself. We'll now go back to the report to the superintendent, picking up from the five o'clock session and Dawkins. Dr. Chadwell, members of the board, just want to draw your attention um, to our staffing report. This begins on page 48. <clears throat> In preparation for the upcoming school year, the administration is requesting additional professional and paraprofessional positions on the attached 2021-2022 additional staffing report one. So on this report, it reflects additional positions needed for the opening of Lake Country Elementary School. And I do want to draw your attention. We did uh, bring positions that were approved in December, the initial positions for that campus. So this would be the balance of the positions for Lake Country Elementary School. Campus growth positions uh, that would support pre-K uh, through 12th grade. Campus specialty positions that are federally funded and the position at uh, as principal at the uh, possible virtual academy, depending on uh, depending on that. We also have, I do want to point out, the instructional and support positions needed, as Dr. Parker referenced in her report, for the possible virtual academy serving grade 6 through 12. That's on page 50, so I've attached that as a separate um, separate report. So we have worked closely with the educational services uh, departments, operation and finance departments to determine the positions to post and hire as enrollment numbers dictate and confidence in funding becomes more secure. So as you can see, the report um, looks a little bit different, but I believe it provides us the flexibility with staffing um, needed at this time. <clears throat> So I'll take any questions. Any questions you have, this will come up as an action item, which will be another opportunity to ask a question, but uh, mm -hmm. any questions this time? No, thank you, Dr. Dawkins. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next is the operations report. We're going to begin, I believe, with construction update. Mr. Fleet Welch. Uh, first of all, tonight we'd like to start with the administration building. So I have two pictures here of uh, <coughs> instructions going on. The, on the left, you see the, some of the piers that are being drilled. So there's roughly 300 plus piers on this job. So we're over halfway finished uh, when this pictures was were taken. Um, and then you can see some of the work on the right over there with rebar, concrete, and um, this, uh, that is the base of the lower uh, portion of the building. So it'll start be it is going up uh, vertically as we speak. Moving over to Boswell High School, we have some pictures of the stadium and the restrooms that are located. You see some of the last steel that's being installed on the uh, three levels of the press box. <clears throat> the uh, buildings that flank on the right and the left are the uh, the new restrooms facilities for the uh, to hold the capacity for the, the stadium. Top left is the uh, that is the new what I would call the um, uh, that was the middle school concession stand that we will lose so that's the new one plus it has restrooms for the visitor side <clears throat> to help them out and they can be also um, used for a Friday night game. On the left, <clears throat> bottom left is just the storage facility that's uh, on the main part of the grandstands. And on the left picture, that was the first day that they were starting to tear down the visitor bleachers. So they were knocking down the fence. And you can see that on the concession stand, they're working on the roof over there. Uh, this is a structural framing, so this has been completed. And now they're working on the uh, doing the roof panels and the guttering system. Um, this building is, out of all the buildings we have, this will be one that lags the furthest behind. Uh, it was planned that way. It just takes a lot longer. You, you can see there's cranes, how high they're gonna have to be up close to 50 feet. So you put in the roof, you put in the lights, um, you have netting. Those things take time because you, you don't have a lot of trades going over each other. In this case, they need to be clear of this just because of safety factor. But once, um, 
<clears throat> Ellis gets on site, it'll be uh, this part will be four to six weeks um, to when they show up and they're ready for the to work on that uh, install of the turf. So that's probably going to be somewhere in the middle of September. Stadium is still planned to open and be ready for the first home game September 3rd and August the 1st. The uh, dressing rooms will be ready for the students and coaches. Still on track for that schedule? Mm -hmm. Still on schedule for that. <clears throat> uh, this is inside the weight room. Uh, shows the HVAC duct work on both those pictures. Uh, currently over the weekend, they put in the glass frame around the weight room, so that's in place. The uh, beam on the left is, um, well, they let all the kids sign the last beam that would go into the press box. So they painted it up, made it look real nice. Uh, then they made it really so nice, instead of putting it up where no one would ever see it, they basically have kept it. So they're gonna put that somewhere in the building where they actually get to see it. So they, anyway, they had another one, so they just made it work. And mm -hmm. so, anyway, on the right is the uh, new tennis pavilion. Uh, you can see that's in between the tennis courts and uh, it'll uh, create some shade for those folks in that area. Uh, Lake Country Elementary is still on schedule for the August 1st, turning that over to the campus staff. Um, they're working on the brick, the rock, landscaping. There's some pictures of the exterior of the building, as you can see those from different angles. We had a, a child that lived out in that area that said we're ruining the school because he thought it was going to be a pink school. Oh, he started putting the brick up because he said, Mama, they're ruining the school. They're putting something over the pink dog's going to be Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's some pictures of the indoor framing, uh, putting in the uh, tile work. Um, let's see. Then on the far right, <clears throat> that's a portion of the stage where they put in the tile. Uh, so the cafeteria is a lot, you know, getting further along than the rest of the building, but it's all coming together. Excuse me. Uh, bottom left is uh, talking about the library with the drop down, far down, and has lighting and slats in it. And so it's moving along. The framing agent back is on the far right, so you can see in this picture, it looks like you could still see through the building. Well, again, that was two weeks ago. You cannot do that anymore. So they've started to sheet rock and all that. So it's, um, again, I'm excited about the progress that's going on over there. So is it dried in now? Is it completely dry? Is there still? I think there's a couple windows they have to put in, but it's not mostly. It's, we've dry. had the last rainstorm, it's hadn't come. There's been no water here in the building. Uh, so this is really one of the closest to the finished rooms. That's the art and music, uh, which is in the area by the cafeteria. So you can, when you start putting the millwork in, that's kind of the, you know, they wait for the carpet, in a sense. Uh, the gym. So they finished the CMU wall. Uh, they painted it or prepped it, primed it, and so it's moving. Remember last time? This time last year, we didn't have a storm shelter at uh, Copper Creek. So this one's moved a lot faster in that area. And that's the panels that are going on top of the roof. They're waiting for it. And this is to put the sidewalk in on the <coughs> Spring Street access point. So the buses will be coming in and some of the uh, traffic from the neighborhoods. Uh, the next one is just a report on the, uh, we have one more elementary in the bond program. It's elementary 18. And one of the first things we need to do is uh, name an architect of record for that, uh, for that project. <clears throat> so the question really becomes, this will be the last one of this bond, but when we have our next bond, either in 22, 23, whenever that is, it's going to have a lot of, it's going to have elementaries in it. So at least one of those is going to be on, need to be on the ground right after the election. So if we've built three of these schools already with the same design, and it's not that we're unhappy with it, but this, if we do it again, it'll be the fourth, then probably there'll be five because we won't have the money to our time to redesign one. Mm -hmm. So this will be probably the opportune time uh, to, if we're gonna change the prototype, this would be the time to do it. So, um, I think that concludes. I think that uh, falls in line with what we've done in previously. Uh, yeah, we've so done three to four, just to, you know, just depends consistent. on how. So, 
Uh, Saginaw Elementary, we're still uh, working on some of those rooms uh, that are on the uh, far wing, and uh, we'll continue working on those as, uh, as soon as we get cleared on the roof. And then we'll return those back over as soon as possible to the uh, teachers and the staff, kids. So that should happen fairly quickly. So, Clay, do you have a timeline for that at all? A, guess, a guesstimate? Not, no, okay. I don't. Because okay. I need the report right and once I know the report then you know it's we got to button it up so a week and a half once we get the report so we've done everything so far up to that point it's just a matter of getting that and then moving to it it's not that we have we have them ready and we've done everything but close up that walls um, on the exterior and we've caulked windows we've done a lot of that stuff but just got to get the clearance on that and we'll be ready to go Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Cleve. Our next operation report a child nutrition report. Mr. Aaron Wiley, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, as you know, of course, last year was a year of change and adapting a little bit, so we found some new ways to feed. Uh, we had curbside locations opened up across the district to feed the students while they weren't in school. Um, we built some partnerships with the churches and, and uh, with the help of Valley Surface in order to help them piggyback some of our locations and do uh, you know, food donations to the same locations. And we also worked with the YMCA with the Y on the Fly program, which helped take uh, meals to students who are studying remotely and not able to get to a, a remote feeding location. Uh, we of course did have a financial impact from the uh, from the COVID uh, days. The average annual return of, a, of the child nutrition program is usually around three hundred thousand dollars a year, which we will then in turn allocate to future projects like we've done at uh, with serving lines at Elkins and Eagle Mountain Elementaries. Uh, 2019-2020, we did experience of a loss of $653,638. $200,000 of that was not necessarily from that year as it was also still paying off uh, some of our past projects at Eagle Mountain, uh, Bryson, and Elkins Elementaries. Uh, but our fund balance, luckily at the end of 1920, was still 1.375 million. Uh, luckily, our department's been pretty fiscally responsible and we're able to sustain uh, loss in a year uh, and make our way through a little bit of the hard times. Uh, over the few, past few months, the increase of in-person in -person learning has actually greatly improved our financial outlook for this year. We started off in January or through December looking like we we're probably going to end up being in the red. And then all of a sudden, you know, numbers started ticking up. We looked up, all right, we might break even. And now it looks like we're probably going to be in the black for the year. So we will not lose any money this year. Uh, meals in January were around 14,000 meals per day. By the time we got to March, it was up to 17,000 meals per day. And now here in April, it looks like it's gonna be around 18,000 meals per day. So it's really helped financially with the uh, child nutrition department. 21-22 uh, pricing, pending the official release, the expectation of the Texas Department of Agriculture will stand by its previous, <clears throat> excuse me, rule implemented in 2018, which stated any district with a positive or zero balance in its nonprofit food service account as of January 31st is exempt from paid paid lunch equity regulations. Of course, over the last week, we've sort of seen some news that this probably won't even matter. It looks like they're going to extend the free meals through next year anyway. Uh, but even if we did have paid meals, we would not have to raise the prices. Have any questions? Great news. Great. We appreciate all your work getting that food out to those kids. That's Thank you very much. Uh, you do a great job. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, next report is the operations uh, report is maintenance update. Mr. Charles Hamilton, <clears throat> welcome Mr. Hamilton. Good evening. Good evening, thank you for being here. The, uh, the summer projects that we uh, have going for the summer are all getting programmed and put together. Uh, the Boswell project on the library louver and the roof cleaning, uh, along with the painting of the doors have already been programmed out. Uh, we already got estimates, PO is in the system and uh, we're on their schedule for this summer to start sometime in June. Uh, the Remington Point project, which is uh, some landscaping repairs on the back side, uh, that project's already about 70% uh, complete.
Uh, we've got uh, a new uh, wall put in place to prevent the erosion from happening, and then we'll uh, put some uh, mulch down around that area to help uh, solidify that since it's very difficult to grow grass back there. Halfway Development Center is also part of that painting project uh, that will happen uh, sometime in June. The Saginaw Elementary, same thing, there's some, some doors, exterior doors and some handrails that we'll be doing is also part of that uh, particular project. Saginaw High School project where we have some water valve concrete blocking where we've had some consolidation of the soils and then the soil sinks and then these concrete blocks kind of stick up out of the ground. So uh, we're working with a contractor currently to get some uh, proper estimates and scheduling on that. So that will happen as well this summer. We just got to get a couple more things uh, solidified on the logistics of that one. Uh, like we do every summer, we've got some uh, parking lot restriping that's going to take place uh, on several campuses, probably about 14 to 15 campuses. That's already been scheduled and ready to take place this summer. And then the last one, the uh, landscaping uh, beds for various projects has kind of been altered somewhat because of the winter storm that we had. And so what we've done is we've gone through every campus, did an evaluation of the landscaping, and then we put together a, a five year plan to address every single campus on what we can do to uh, bring back what was lost before and then what the, uh, the freeze killed out. So those are those are the projects and they're being moved along at a, uh, at a very good rate. Did we lose any trees or any anything larger than just shrubs that were? Oh yeah, the trees are on the list as well. We lost some. Yes, sir. Yeah. Like we had a meeting this morning, our leadership team meeting, and Mr. Hamilton was in the meeting. He has a spreadsheet with every tree that was damage due to the winter and then also there's another spreadsheet with those that were previous to that so um, they're basically going to do uh, two different sets of reinstallation of plants but of course i think the trees will be in october yes. or november right so they'll wait on those just to make sure that they'll they'll take we also are going to use a little bit of a different methodology mr welch talked to us about it this morning in the past we've replaced a large amount at one time but obviously anytime you put plants um, that number in you have to maintain it with a lot of water and so we're actually going to do sets of plants and make sure we do intense watering in that area so we can maintain it because we're talking 28 property 28 schools and so rather do sections to make sure that everything is alive and we don't have any kind of significant loss there so well we have a pretty good replacement plan for all those that's still your thunder anything you want to add no that, that's good i mean a good example of that is Saginaw high school with the blue mountain construction they, they keep uh, clipping this line or that line and so currently our irrigation system is not all that reliable because of that construction so we don't want to put a bunch of plants out there and then all of a sudden somebody gets a line and they can't water so we want to uh, delay that one maybe a year till that stuff out front gets done so those are all have been considerations in how we laid that plan out well, thank you. Any other questions? Um, all right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Oh, you're doing a great job there. Appreciate it. All right. Next is the uh, bond projects update. Mr. Philly Kidd, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Board President Luca, members of the board, Dr. Chadwell. Uh, as you were updated on earlier with our construction update, you know, with our large projects. Tonight, I will give you a follow up for our next phase of bond projects scheduled to be completed uh, the 2021 school year. Uh, if you recall, these projects were grouped into categories and they were listed on your board agenda item uh, by category and all the campuses involved. Construction, uh, one of the categories is adding sidewalks and ramps, uh, door replacements, masonry work, uh, and some ceiling work within that category. Uh, those campuses involved Elkins, Eagle Mountain Elementary, Gilliland, Boswell High School, Creekview Middle School. Uh, an RFP is being finalized in hopes that that will get on the street this week so that proposals can re be received back by May the 12th and be on the agenda for approval for the May board meeting. We also went ahead and included the fencing category in that since it ended up growing, that category ended up growing with the number of boundary fences and some well fences that we'd screening that we needed to provide. So uh, those have been included in that construction uh, category as well, so that we can seek that job order contractor for this type of work. And obviously those campuses were listed as well. Then we had furniture, fixture and equipment. 
We had replacing uh, the remaining auditorium seating at Boswell High School. Uh, years ago, there were a number of those receipts replaced, and we we're wanting to go ahead and complete that replacement uh, this summer. We have uh, addition of choir risers and gym bleachers at Elkins Elementary, replacements of, of the existing there, and new cafeteria tables at Eagle Mountain Elementary. Uh, those quotes have all been received, POs have uh, been created, and we're in the process of finalizing with these vendors uh, delivery and installation of those items. Our floors. Uh, the big, uh, biggest floor project we had going this summer will be the refinishing of the Boswell High School gym floors. Uh, we're waiting for a final rendering from that floor company. Uh, once that's approved, then we can uh, create that PO and schedule that work for this summer as well. But that'll be a complete refinish of the competition gym uh, with all of the labeling that goes on there and the refinishing of the, of the uh, auxiliary gym with all the restriping. Then we have landscape improvements. And as y'all touched on a while ago, obviously that has changed a little bit in the way that scope is going to be finalized because many of the campuses that we had in our uh, uh, list of, of projects were impacted by this freeze. So we're in the process now of reevaluating. Uh, the bond scope will be coordinated with the maintenance operation scope. Uh, the plan is to have a, you know, an RFP created by the end of May and uh, schedule in place by July on how to proceed with uh, uh, these, pr these projects. And obviously that schedule will be determined based on you know, plan availability, season for planning, and uh, phasing in with the number of projects and the number of landscape projects that are on the list now. Uh, lighting, lighting replacements and upgrades in gym corridors and cafeterias. We have the quotes that have been received and tonight we'll be bringing you an action item for approval for these <coughs> item upgrades. And all work will be scheduled to be complete before August the 15th. Uh, playground improvements. Again, it's the same situation. We have received all the quotes and we'll be bringing you an action item for approval of our playground upgrades. With that work to be scheduled to be completed before August the 15th. Uh, the theater piece. We have uh, stage curtains for Elkins and Eagle Mountain Elementary and new orchestra pit cover for Basel High School. Those quotes have been received. POs have been recreated, created, and again, we're coordinating the schedule for installation and replacement of those items. And we brought to you uh, a couple of board meetings ago with the uh, turf, adding the synthetic turf at Chisholm Trail High School at Saginaw High School baseball and softball fields uh, that y'all approved at the uh, uh, I believe the January board meeting, the amount of $5,642,000. Uh, that work will start as probably as quick as next week uh, at Chisholm Trail High School. That'll probably be the first campus that they'll get started at. With all of that work scheduled be completed by mid-September <coughs> at both campuses. So with all of that in place, you know, when we brought this to you, we approached you with these projects not to exceed $9 million. Uh, with the values of quotes received and an estimate of outstanding quotes we will be receiving, uh, we're very confident that all the work is still going to remain well below the nine million that was uh, that was set aside for all of this work. I'll be glad to answer any questions. I have a question. Yes, sir. So on the playground improvements, um, as I walk around the elementary schools, at, well, middle and high school as well, but um, most of our playgrounds are very limited. Um, accessibility so all accessibility so all access for children with disabilities or wheelchairs etc so in that bid that you provided us is there is there um those kind of improvements as well so i'd say i'd say the bulk of the uh of the playground improvements will involve our uh, specials programs and updating equipment that way which will increase a larger footprint of the playground okay. to be able to provide that equipment as well as a path to get to those spaces, okay. but at the same time, that it provides that availability for uh, easy access between mainstream equipment and, and special program equipment. Okay, great, thank you. So it so it will be fully accessible. Those improvements will be fully accessible. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, have a and I have one more go question, go but not Sorry. for Mr. Kidd, but for I forgot to ask Cleet something. Okay, and don't go too far because you had the first three actions. I'll be here. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. This plate's coming up. Please. I just want to just say that 
how thankful I am just for all the various bond projects. It's exciting to get this point at this point of the bond project because we know we hit a lot of different items since 2018. We're kind of waiting for this day to where <coughs> literally every campus in the whole entire school district is getting is affected by it. So uh, thank you all for your leadership in that area. And it's just great to see these improvements throughout the district, particularly things that that just make such a substantive change, such as our lighting and refinishing of of facilities and courts and, and tile and carpet, things that truly transform a school. So thank you again for your work on that. Sorry, Cleet, I forgot to ask you about, um, we've had several people that have asked about um, in the bond, in, in the former prior bond, there was uh, HVAC equipment for Saginaw Elementary. Okay. Can you, can you, and, and we've had, I've had several people over the last few weeks ask about that um and where we are on it and if we're going to do it and etc can you just for the record just kind of give us sure a, um, um, a status and and future plans that would be helpful yeah so Thank the 2017 you. bond had uh up to, I, i'm talking off the top of my head but roughly uh, i want to say roughly 10 to 12 schools and have hvac upgrades plan and all that was uh backloaded to 2025 uh, so it is still in the bond program. It is there, but it was never, it's not scheduled to 2025. Now, granted, if some emergency happens and we need to come back and say, hey, let's push this up like we do sometimes, you know, I think we still have that option on any one of those campuses. But, you know, just because something breaks doesn't mean, you know, that's a maintenance issue. Just mm -hmm. like last month, it was hot in here. Mm -hmm. Well, right before the meeting, you know, we had a problem. So it comes down to this. Do you go ahead and put all new units in here when we're only going to be here for another less than 12 months? Or do you just try to get by? And as long as you can keep it comfortable. So I had last week, I had done our HVAC group just do a screenshot of all the classrooms in Sagan Elementary. And it was between 72 and 67 degrees. So I didn't see anything that was abnormal. And and if we do, those guys get right on it. So it's uh, something we watch on all our campuses, but uh, I don't see a something that's really broken at this point that would have to bring it up from a 2025 schedule. Great, thank you. And then the other thing on the new, all the all the new elementary schools, are we making those play, are ensuring that those playgrounds are going to be fully accessible? They have been. They have been. Okay. Yes. Well, I thought so, but I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I have the phone now, Mr. Bowen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Perfect timing. What if I do now? Yes. Do that? All school. Yep. Sorry, just hung up on you. We're now to the action items. Uh, the first is to act on the purchase and installation of the weight equipment for Boswell High School. Mr. Kidd. I recommend we award to advance exercise the purchase and installation of weight equipment for Boswell High School at the cost not to exceed 403,295.48. Second. Motion by Donna, second by Tim to award to advance exercise for the Boswell weight equipment. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7-0. Next is act on the purchase and installation of playground equipment for multiple campuses. I move we award to the pl playground depot the purchase of and installation of playground equipment for multiple campuses at a cost not to exceed $235,429. Motion by Donna, second by Paige to award the playground depot. Any questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7-0. Next is to act on the purchase and installation of lighting upgrades for multiple campuses. I move we award to facility services group the purchase and installation for lighting upgrades for multiple campuses at a cost not to exceed $219,341. Second. $46, okay. $46. No, second. 40 cents. Oh, okay. And 40 cents. 
There we go. Motion as written, Donna and Marilyn seconded. Yes, thank you. Any questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries 7 0. You yeah, ask the coffee for that. I sure do. Thank you all very much. That's a very good job, Mr. Kidd. Thank you very much. Next is to consider approving additional staffing report. One we heard in a report earlier, uh, Dr. Dawkins. As I pre presented in my request earlier this evening, the administration is requesting the board's consideration of approving the additional staffing report one for the following positions. So it would be the additional positions needed for the opening of Lake Country Elementary School, the campus and growth positions supporting pre-K through 12, campus specialty positions that are federally funded, <coughs> and the principal position at the possible virtual academy. I recommend the board approve the 2021-2022 additional staffing report one for the positions at Lake Country Elementary School, campus growth, specialty positions, and the principal position at the possible virtual academy. Motion by Liz, second by Paige for the 2021-22 additional staffing report one. Any questions on that? Just a clarification. So sure. the, that's not a decision on the virtual academy that will come later. This is just approving the position. So you right. we go that direction. If we do vote then, yeah. The keyword there was possible, I think. But I just wanted enough. to make sure okay. since everybody, okay. sometimes people just come on for this portion and weren't here for the yeah. reports so earlier. So the principal position is we would be voting on tonight for that position. Mm -hmm. But all the additional positions mm -hmm. would hold until next month. And if the virtual academy did not occur, we would simply utilize that position in an existing campus mm -hmm. somewhere okay. else spot. Okay. Any other clarifications? And we would let that person know that, obviously, prior right. to that it was right. tentative. Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are no motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dawkins. Next bids and proposal, uh, Mr. Rob Welch, we have extension of proposal for abatement of asbestos containing materials in definite quantities. I move we extend the agreement with Advol Incorporated for the abatement of the asbestos containing materials in definite quantities for the third option year to expire May 31st, 2022. The estimate estimated annual expense is $100,000. Actual total will depend on the district's needs. Second. Motion by Donna, second by Paige. Questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed and there are none, motion carries 7-0. Next is fire and security alarm services and products. I move we award the proposal of fire and security alarm services and products to SAS Security Alarm Services Company, Inc. The estimated annual total is 175,000, estimate based on previous year's expenditures. Motion by Donna, second by Page. Any questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7 0. Next one, Mr. Welch, is uh, the extension of proposal for propane fuel. I move we extend the agreement with Northwest Propane Gas Com Company for propane fuel for the second year option to expire July 31st, 2022. Estimated annual expense is 223480 Actual total will depend on product usage. Second. Motion by Donna, second by Liz. To extend the agreement with the Northwest Propane Gas Company. Any questions, clarifications needed? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed and there are none, motion carries 7-0. The next action item, uh, Mr. Welch has to consider approving a resolution regarding extension of delegation of authority during severe winter weather emergency. All right, trustees, uh, good evening one more time. We have a item, uh, this, a resolution in your packet, as you all recall, on February 22nd, 2021. 
at that meeting uh, that was very early in the winter weather emergency. Uh, the, the board voted to provide uh, delegate authority to the superintendent to act on matters uh, during that uh, during that emergency, uh, including the ability to procure uh, uh, vendors for the repair of our facilities. Uh, that initial authorization was at the million dollar number. As we have uh, again, that was early in the in the emergency. As we have started to gather all the time and material estimates, and really starting to pull in all the the uh, items subject to that claim. Uh, uh, we are estimating that uh, that authority uh, needs to be at the $6 million uh, level. Uh, it would not exceed that amount. Uh, we expect the claim to actually be more than that, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, the district has a deductible of about $100,000 for this particular event, and we uh, anticipate all of those costs would be uh, reimbursed by insurance, but we would have to uh, uh, extend the funds ahead of time and then get the uh, get the uh, insurance proceeds uh, as a reimbursement, which is the process we are going through right now. And so this authority, this uh, uh, resolution provides the additional emergency authority uh, to affect and, and pay those uh, pay those contracts, those emergency contracts. I move to approve the resolution regarding the extension of delegation of authority during severe winter weather as presented. Second. second. My list, second by Marilyn. I have a question for you. The, um, the first page says it's uh, ranging between eight and nine million on the claims, the water and restoration. And then the second page says we're gonna be around six million to give him authority. If it's so, covered by insurance, is there a reason we wouldn't and so the uh, the total amount of the claim we do expect it all whether it's uh, it could be as much as eight to nine million, but uh, we are able to secure uh, some of the contracts under our existing approved vendors. Therefore, they would not be subject to the oh, emergency okay. declaration. They won't emergency fall under this declaration. Or, or That's the, a good question. I got you. We're hoping, you know, obviously that when you go into one of those uh, situations that you can utilize your approved vendors, but all of the vendors were stretched to um, uh, to uh, deal with a statewide emergency. Some one of our restoration, restoration vendors was from Florida, I believe, but yeah, we didn't ask for more authority than we needed because we already did. So, well, so it could yeah. cost not me, and which still is covered by insurance. Correct. But some of that will be just covered under our regular procurement Correct. procedures. We're just asking for the authority up to six million. <clears throat> yes. Question. Uh, we give Dr. Chadwell a lot of leeway and stuff. I mean, <clears throat> why, why put it? I mean, he's going to do what's best for the district. Why do you, why do you even put a cap on it? Where that has to come back and then we have to make another decision to if it's something really bad then we just vote again to say go to nine or ten million dollars <clears throat> so why not just give him the authority to do what he's got to do in the best interest of the school district i mean why why cap uh, is there a need for that at this point or have you, you pretty much know what all the expenses are in this cover list as far as a, a, as far as we know, I mean, we felt like yeah. we explored every. But damage. this will be in here for any other emergency coming forward too, correct? No, sir. This would just be tied to this event. Oh, it's just tied to this event. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, if we wanted to make a policy confusing. change, if we wanted to make a change in policy, there's policy specific. It's about emergencies that I think we did about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. But we could go back and look at that policy to extend. <clears throat> um, I would say if we did that, there would need to be reporting pieces that required me to come back in in the next regularly called meeting to give expense reports or sure. some kind of accountability piece that would do that but we can explore that through policy to see if it's a cb local if i remember correctly uh ch local ch local currently yeah. uh that authority is set at two hundred fifty thousand dollars in policy uh, but, uh, <clears throat> to me know. that would be the part we would need to look at and when then it covers any emergency i was thinking of anything in the future so I guess the policy that we have would, you know, I would be in favor of looking at something like that. So then he just comes again and uh, carries carries on the duties of the district and then informs us, you know, each board meeting where what that uh, catastrophe is 
is headed and how much it's costing at the time. But we don't have to. We don't have to come back and keep giving, you know, authority to do something that we know he's going to have to do anyway. Well, I don't know if that speaks directly to this motion, but we will add it to a future a agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Daughtry. Any other questions? The motion would still stay as it says a res as, uh, the resolution as presented. The motion was by Liz and the second was by Marilyn. Any questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Welch. And we will look at that in a future meeting, Mr. Daughtry. That takes us to our routine monthly reports uh, from the tax collection reports. Uh, there's multiple bids and proposals in there that uh, we've approved in the past. The foundation financial <coughs> report was also included as well as um, reported purchase made to the cooperative program. Are there any questions on those reports? Seeing none, we'll move on to reviewing the 2021 board planning calendar, Dr. Chad. Yes, sir, that's on page 210 of your packet. You'll notice in the next meeting that we will have Minister Oath of Office for places one and two. We'll also have a recognition for all ALI and AEI participants. We'll do it similar as we did in this last last year. Uh, we'll also have a most likely an additional staffing report too. Um, we do have a obviously a fairly lengthy staffing report one, but again, provide you information of, of contingencies moving into the summer. Um, we'll also have a finance report. Um, we're very hopeful to have the April and preliminary May information for the taxable assessed value evaluations from TAD, a construction update, and we'll also have election of officers and then a consideration for naming an architect of record for elementary 18. All right, thank you again. If you want to add something uh, to that agenda, maybe as Mr. Daughtry recommended <laughs> earlier, you be sure to let us know and Dr. Chabell or myself so we can add it in there. Uh, next is the consent agenda for approval. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Tim, second by Liz to approve the consent agenda. Any questions on that item to discuss? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? And there are none. Motion carries 7-0. As far as uh, my announcements, I, I uh, am excited that the school year is moving along. I know y'all are too. Y'all continue to do an excellent job with our students and with our staff, and we appreciate all the efforts that go mm -hmm. into it, as well as Dr. Parker, now you're working on another project for us. For, so we appreciate all that extra effort. We know it has to take. Um, the SLI that's coming up, uh, Becky mentioned that uh, the registration opens Wednesday, or we can. Um, Wednesday, we are allowed to put our name in the hat as the district wants to attend in person. Okay. We're not going to draw that name until May 8th. May 8th, okay. In the meantime, I'm watching for the session selectors. Those that are going to attend virtual don't have to choose sessions ahead of time. Correct. Those who are attending in person will have to before I can register. Okay, and some of us have indicated uh, in person attendance, so you know who you are. Just make sure you kind of keep up with that with Becky so she can get us registered for housing. Uh, Dr. Chapel? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a few dates that coming up. I mentioned the May 11th um, special meeting to canvas the 2021 trustee election results. That's at 430. I believe Ms. Nevins already have names of people that will attend that for the canvassing. Okay, and then also May 15th, we have the EMS Education Foundation Awards Gala that will be at Chisholm Trail. It's at 630. It's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be a, a food event um, in, because of social distancing. I believe they'll have some snacks and things like that, but it's not going to be a full meal. But um, they've done a really good job putting that together. It'll be a really nice uh, event that evening. Also, May 21st, we have a bad weather makeup day. Um, and then also want to point out we have our graduations on May 28th and 29th. Very excited about our first opportunity to go to Dickey's Arena uh, for graduations. And also this one's going to be different. I have a, as y'all know, I have a kid graduating and so that's going to be odd. I'm glad it's the last one so I can wipe all the tears away from my eyes afterwards. So no, we're really excited about that. I know the kids are. Um, also just want to say as we're going into this uh, month of May, we know this year has been challenging. We know we've, we've dealt with um, so many things we would have never imagined in our careers or our lifetimes. And we've had so many people that have worked so hard to make sure 
that we have dealt with COVID, we've dealt with snowmageddon, we've dealt with every uh, curveball that's been thrown at us. And as we plan for this next year, I think we're all ready for normal. And as was requested earlier, we'll be putting out some communication next week with the those um, what if some of those things you know are challenging to commit to without the state making those commitments. But certainly we can talk about our intentions of moving forward and what we desire to do. And we're definitely ready for that. So again, thank you all for all your support. Um, as we do that planning and, and especially as we talk about um, everything that's happening at the legislative level right now. So again, appreciate you all. And um, if there's anything y'all need in terms of information that would help you as we go into the, this budget planning session going into May and June, it it's, it's normally takes place over three months and now it's being condensed into a very short period of time. And so again, we'll probably call a special meeting if we may to, to do a budget workshop. I think a budget workshop yeah. is in our future based on just everything we've heard. Tonight. Right. And so I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Welch to give you all weekly or biweekly updates on anything legislative legislatively. I know we put some articles in there, but we want to translate those articles and what here's what it means a specifically dollar amount. And so we'll start that with this Friday and, and we'll work on that tomorrow. And I know uh, some of us that are involved with the legislative uh, actions of of the TASB are getting calls to support or, or information about bills. But if there's something like that, if this board needs to react to collectively well, and contact our representatives, I would, you know, please let us know. Absolutely. And I will be in Austin on Thursday to visit elected officials and to meet with various individuals and in planning for those bills that are coming um, up this week. Great. <coughs> See if there's no further business to come before this board, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Motion by Donna, second by Marilyn. We're adjourned. <laughs>